friends, welcome to Foundation Church. My name is John. Uh, today we're going to continue or complete this little three-part Easter series that we started uh, today by talking about on the way. Yeah, Jesus meeting us on the way, God meeting us on the way. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But before I get into that, I want to set the scene of like a personal story for you. So I was in seminary, that's a master's degree for pastors. I was all of 22 years old, newly married, one kid already. Another one soon to be on the way, but I didn't know that yet. And because I was going to school somewhere between one and three hours away, depending on the traffic, I was spending a lot of time away from my new wife and my favorite child at the time, my only child, Emily. And I kept missing important milestones. For anyone who's had a kid, you know that from one week to the next, especially in the early years, they are rapidly progressing and growing, developing and changing. And I kept missing things. And it was discouraging. And before I go any further with the story, I have to ask all of you, now this is gonna start out with a show of hands, but then you're gonna get to share with somebody around you. The question is, have you ever missed something big? Have you ever missed out on something? Now this could be something big with your family, this could be something big with a spouse or a friend, this could be something big at work, and this can be good big stuff, like you know, some developmental thing or promotional thing, but this could also be bad stuff, like workplace drama. Like, oh, are you kidding me? Joe and Sam got into a fight last week and I missed it on vacation? How many of you show of hands have ever missed out on something big in your life? Okay, good. I'm not alone. It's almost all of us. Now take a second and share with somebody around you a big thing that you missed out on. Go ahead and share. Online people, just comment down below. Okay. Hopefully you at least got to start telling somebody about the big thing. Hopefully most of you it wasn't dramatic, like workplace fights. I'm sorry for even suggesting that. The big thing for me, the straw that broke the camel's back, was when I was sitting in class in seminary. Now, mind you, I'm an old man. So like texting, and especially texting photos, was like a big deal. It didn't happen often. But I got a text from my wife, Crystal, with a photo and I think we have the photo. Go ahead and throw it up. This is the photo of little tiny six-month-old Emily standing for the first time ever. Now, first of all, I was like amazed and impressed because she was like a, a bald little baby. Like babies aren't supposed to stand. Second of all, I showed it to all my classmates who were all like, this is a lie. This child is not standing. Which I was like, she is, this is real, and I missed it. They're like, nah, your wife's pranking you, dude. Like, kids, kids that age don't stand. But she was. Now, I have to give you a little behind the scenes. There may have been a little help in having her stand. Like, Crystal may have propped her little tiny body up and pulled her hand away and took a picture quickly. Uh, and she may not have stood much longer than that. Um, but this was the one where I was like, I'm doing the wrong thing. I shouldn't be missing these important milestones. I was, like, devastated. And perhaps the big thing that you've missed in your life or the big things that you have missed in the past, it's like, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back and see it. And today we're going to be talking about missing a big thing, the resurrection. We're gonna be talking about disciples who saw an empty tomb or heard an empty tomb and it wasn't enough and they left. They gave up. They were ready to go home, pack it up, call it a day, and be done, because they missed it. And the reason why we're talking about this is maybe some of you here today, although normally the Sunday after Easter, none of you, but maybe some of you missed Easter last week. You're like, I didn't even know that was, e this isn't Easter today? But more likely, some of you have been to Easter after Easter after Easter, and people stand up there and they're like, he is risen, and they clap and they cheer and they're excited, and you're like, I must be missing something, because this doesn't seem as awesome to me. If that's you or has been you at times, today is the message for you. Because today we're going to talk about the reality that God doesn't just show up once. It's not just a one-time thing and you missed it, but rather God keeps showing up. And oftentimes when we are on the way, when we are on the way, 
God comes alongside us. Now, to help us talk about that, we're going to be looking at Luke's gospel. I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. And we're going to put it up on the screen for you, but if you're like me and you brought your own Bible, we'll turn the lights on for you, and you can pull out your Bible and find Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Uh, it's important to know really quickly, just to set up a little bit of the scene here, that this is the same day as Easter. This is often not a scripture we talk about on Easter Sunday, but this occurred in the very same day. The same day Jesus rose from the dead, this story is happening. And so when it talks about on the same day, that's the same day that it's referring to. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer? Did he have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is God's word is given freely to each and every one of you. I want to take you back to verse 15. The verse 15 was toward the beginning here, and in verse 15 we're told, as they talked, these two disciples who were on the way to Emmaus, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. There's a couple things I want to highlight here. The first thing is this idea that they are on their way to Emmaus. What's going on here is they are heading back home, back to the real world, back to life. They're giving up. They're packing it in. It's been three days Jesus was killed, and they're done. They're ready to move on to whatever's next. They're quitting. And maybe that is how you felt at times. It had a good run. I gave it a try. Now it's time to get back to reality. And yet on the journey back, we're told that they encounter Jesus himself. Jesus himself came up and walked with them. This is personal. Jesus didn't send a messenger. He didn't send an angel. It wasn't a, like a bubble floating in the air that was assigned to them, right? It wasn't a rock along the road that kind of looked like something. It was him. And it's important that we realize that and recognize that because the God that we believe in, the God that we serve, the God that we call ours is personal. God is personal. God longs to be involved in your life in an intimate and personal way, daily. Not just like 
once in a great while, through distant, far-off signs. Sometimes people tell me, they say, I believe in a higher power. That's great. That is a great, great start. But time and time again in Scripture, what we see is God is personal. God isn't just some power out there. God is a person who longs to be in relationship with you. No, it doesn't stop here. I want to continue and drive us on to verse 21. Because in verse 21, we have the two, Cleopas and some other, maybe another disciple, another man, maybe Cleopas's wife, we're not sure. But Cleopas and the other, they're talking to Jesus. And they say this funny thing. They say, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And there's, you know, something important going on here when they use this word hoped. Right? They didn't say we had trusted or we had believed. They said we had hoped. And hope is way weaker than trust or believe. Let me give you an example. If I brought a chair up here, I would say I believe this chair will hold me or I trust this chair will hold me. If I say I hope this chair will hold me, it's a totally different conversation, right? If I say I hope this chair holds my weight, you're all like, it's gonna crack, it's gonna fall, and he's gonna fall on the ground. Let's go, baby, let's do it. But if I say I know, I believe, I trust. And so these disciples, they're not, we know, we trust, we believe. They are, we hope. But the more important part here is past tense. They said we hoped, not we do hope. We hoped, which means they don't hope any longer. Right? They're not trusters, they're not believers, they're hopers, and now they're not even that. They are hopeless. They've moved beyond even hoping. And of course they say that we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That word redeem literally means to pay a ransom to set free. It's ironic because that's exactly what Jesus did. In dying on the cross, he paid a ransom not just to set Jerusalem free, not just to set all Jews free, not even to set all people of God free, but to set all of creation free. It's funny that they say that we had hoped that, but they don't anymore. Now, I want to take us finally to verse 30, and this is going to bleed a little bit into verse 31. See, in verse 30, we're told that when he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But Jesus does a weird thing. He takes the role of the host. This isn't his home. He's not in charge, and yet he takes the role that was traditionally for the host, picks up the bread and gives thanks, and breaks it. But we're told that in the breaking of the bread, in the passing and sharing of this meal, they recognized him. They realized he was who he was. And some scholars debate, well, how did they recognize him, right? And maybe you're thinking, how? How did they recognize Jesus? How did they realize it was him? And some scholars say, well, it was, it was the holes in the hands. When he picked up the bread, they could, they could see the holes in the resurrected Christ's hands. And, and other people say, no, it was more like, you know, like this spiritual moment where Jesus became known to them in a spiritual way. Maybe he, like, glowed, like when he was on the mountaintop with the, the inner three or Others yet say, well, maybe it was like the way he spoke it. The, the language he used reminded them of something he had taught. I have to be honest, the how isn't super important. The what is what matters more. Because what matters is that Jesus made himself known to them. It doesn't matter how he did it. What matters is that he did it. Could you imagine if Jesus walked with them, taught them, and then never made himself known to them? Never let them know? that it was him? Talk about missing out on something big. But he did make himself known to them. And it wasn't immediately, it took some time. They had to spend some time with Jesus before Jesus let them know. Again, Jesus encountered them on the way. And I wanna emphasize this, I can't say this clearly enough, it was on the way to giving up. They were not on the way to church. They were not on the way to the empty tomb. They were on the way home. They had given up hope. They weren't even hoping. And it was there that the resurrected Christ encountered them. And this should be good news for all of you because you all are in church, crushing it. You are way further along than these guys. They were quitting. And you're here. But this is a reminder that Jesus encounters us on the way.
I want to take you back to that verse 15 because there's a really important word there, Jesus walked along with them. And that word literally means to journey with. It, it means to walk parallel to, right? It's not to interact with, right? Not perpendicular, hit you once and gone, but rather to walk alongside parallel for however long it takes. That's the way God works in our lives. God encounters us where we are and walks with us at the pace that we can manage as he's taking us to where we should be, to where we belong. As I was thinking about this, I was trying to think, like, what's, a, what's an analogy, what's a, a common way that people can relate to this? And I thought, you know who does this a lot in our lives? Is really, really good teachers. Really good teachers are the ones who meet us where we are and take us to where we need to go. And so I want to ask you that question. I want to give you a chance. If you're online, to comment down below. But if you're in person, to share with somebody around you who's the best teacher you've ever had, the very best teacher you've ever had. Go ahead and share with somebody around you who that person is. Okay, hopefully you got a chance to share a name or two. If you're online, go ahead and tag them down below so they know that they are the best teacher you've ever had, right? That's super fun to do. Here's the thing. When I was thinking about this for myself, I said to my wife, I said, honey, this is hard because I was a bad student. Like, I wasn't a good kid sometimes. I had one teacher in fifth grade, that poor guy, I won't say his name because he had to deal with me already. But he, we had like our names on the board and he would put check marks next to like days of detention, days that you missed recess. I had like a thousand of them, like a thousand. It was like, he was like, John, you're gonna miss recess in high school. I was like, I don't think they have high, recess in high school. He's like, but you're missing it, it's happening. But as I was thinking about teachers, I couldn't help but think about my wife's story because it turns out that Crystal had this one teacher that was like phenomenal. And so I wanna lift up this teacher instead. Her name was Miss Lynn. And she was an art teacher in Kander High School. She was excellent. Now, she was a really good like, art teacher. She was just what you think an art teacher is, by the way, like very artsy and artistic and like all of all that goes along with it, like super granola, right? That was Miss Lynn. But she was like an excellent teacher. She taught Crystal to draw and perspective, and she did a whole bunch with pottery, with ceramics, and she taught Crystal all that, which for Crystal was this awesome thing. That's what she went to college for because she was so inspired by Miss Lynn. But this teacher went beyond being a teacher. She became like a friend and a confidant. And she learned that my wife, her parents were divorced and my wife's mother lived in Florida and Miss Lynn became a mother figure for Crystal. So much so that on Crystal's one and only college visit as a senior, it wasn't her mom who took her. It wasn't her dad. It wasn't her grandparents. It was Miss Lynn who drove her to Buffalo to visit the college. She took Crystal and met her where she was and walked with her to where she needed to go. And I wanna to suggest to you that that's what Jesus does for each and every one of us. He meets us right where we are. Sometimes that's like as we're walking out the door, never to come back. Sometimes it's when we're sitting here but we're just going through the motions. Sometimes it's when we're really trying to figure it out. And that's the ironic thing about God, is we seek after God. We struggle to follow God. All the while, God is walking right alongside us. Don't work so hard. I'm right here with you right now. Sometimes it takes some time for God to make himself known to us. I'm gonna suggest that's because there are times when we're not ready yet. But God is walking with you at the pace that you can navigate, at the pace you can manage. Longing to show you more and more about himself. And this all happens on the way, right? On the way. Wherever you're going, Jesus is going with you. Whatever you're doing, Jesus is walking with you, meeting you where you're at and hoping to take you to where you need to go. Now, I want to affirm this, that Jesus is with you. But I want to even more emphasize the idea that Jesus will make himself known to you. There's some of you who are like, I know God 
this much. Others of you are like, I know God this much. Turns out God is infinite. And there is so much to know. But God knows that drinking from a fire hydrant is a dangerous endeavor. And so he gives us a little bit, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. So be patient. Know that God is being patient with you. And trust, not hope, not even believe, and trust that God is with you and he is actively making himself known to you. Pray with me if you would. God, thank you for the reminder that no matter who we are, no matter where we are, and most importantly, no matter where we're going, you are willing to meet us there. You are willing to come alongside us, to walk with us, to help us get to where we need to go. Encourage us with that good news today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.